Good afternoon, Stacy. This is Diana. Uh, I'll be helping you out this afternoon, and I'm ready to go when you are. Thanks, Diana. Appreciate your help. Uh, committee is scheduled to start at 1.30, so we'll give people another minute or two to uh, finish wolfing down their lunch and uh, turn on their cameras. So we'll get going here shortly. All right. Good morning, every. Or, oh, wait. Hold on. It's afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's one thirty. Um, so we'll get started with today's public safety and health committee meeting. Um, it is a continuation from a previous um, committee meeting. Uh, so if uh, Diana, if you could put up on the screen how folks would like or can participate in our meeting. We continue to meet virtually because on Wednesdays, the municipal court uses council chambers for uh, their third courtroom. And- you, we, I'm oh. sorry to interrupt. I don't believe that um, that we're in a public session. It looked like it, we, so we were yeah. in practice. Oh, oh, it looks like we are now. I'm, I'm sorry, it looks like the, the webinar has started. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Okay, no worries. Thanks for uh, flagging that. Yes, Diana had given the green light to go. So, um, all right, perfect. We, I think all systems ago. And um, folks can continue to be in touch with council members and track what upcoming council meetings as committee meetings are happening and what are open for comment by visiting the city's website at www.ci.missoula.mt.us. Um, that's kind of the landing page for all the things that are happening in council world and ways for you to participate virtually. And um, then we are meeting in person and virtually in a hybrid format on Monday nights. Um, you can leave a comment uh, at that site. You can also email council at council at ci.missoula.mt.us, or you can always leave a uh, voicemail if you don't want to uh, put your words in writing, um, and that gets voicemail gets digitized and sent out to all members of council, and you can do that by calling 406-552-6012. For those who are joining us today in public safety and health, um, you can raise your hand by clicking star nine to raise and lower when we get to the public uh, comment portion of today's committee meetings. So um, we, okay, 
So order of operations for today, um, we are, like I said, picking up from when I left off, we need to first do a roll call. While Diana is doing that, I'm going to work to um, add Faith and Leah to a, um, present. So Diana, could you do a roll call vote? Starting the vote, Stacy Anderson. Present. Merita Becerra. Present. Daniel Carlino. Present. John Contos. Here. Jordan Hess. Present. Gwen Jones. Present. Kristen Jordan. Present. Mike Nugent. Present. Jennifer Savage. Present. Amber Sherrill. Sandra Visica. Present. Heidi West. Present. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, we have an hour today, a little less than an hour. Um, I would love it if we get to the point where we feel like we can vote at the end of this. So there is a motion on the floor, but we were in the middle of, uh, we were just ending public comment. So wanna first kind of figure out order of operations. Uh, wanna give the, uh, Resolution sponsor, Daniel, uh, Carlino, and Kristen Jordan, um, if they have a quick uh, update or overview. Then we also have um, representatives from All Nations Health Center, as well as the uh, City County Public Health Department, who were unable to join us last time, were able to join us and give comment on that. Then we'll go to public comment, and then we'll go to, or uh, sorry, we'll go to council questions, public comment, council comments and then a vote. Um, so with that, um, want to make sure Diana that we're adding both Faith Price and Leah Fitch Brody, as well as it does look like Dr. Larry Norris is here as well. Um, upgrade them all to panelists and I will let Mr. Carlino give a brief overview to refresh us where we are. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, it sounds like there might be some people in the waiting room. I'm not sure if there's anything we can do about that, um, but thanks for upgrading uh, Dr. Norris. Um, yeah, you wanted to address some of the lingering questions from last week um, and just give a little bit overview um, to follow up with the PowerPoint presentation that me and Dr. Norris gave. Um, so I'll start with some questions um, just for the council to think about. Uh, knowing the health benefits of anthenogenic plants, why should we as a government turn people into criminals for plant practices. Knowing that the current Nixon era drug policies that we live under today are disproportionately harming people that are low income or people of color, why would we as a council continue these policies? And the last question for council members, um, as the government, should we be spending taxpayer money, which is police time, to criminalize people for things that they do with their own body and for crimes that have no victims? Before council members ans answer those questions with their vote today, I want to address the lingering questions from the last meeting. Um, I wanna start by saying uh, this resolution is not asking for legalization. It's asking to not use taxpayer money to arrest people for entheogenic plant use. Um, and the study attached to the agenda today is an opinion piece and speaks about legalization. Therefore that attached study is not relevant to this resolution. The studies that mention marijuana legalization's effects on children's rates of use of marijuana are not relevant to this resolution that works towards some form of decriminalization because we are asking to work towards a form of decriminalization, not legalization. They are two completely different things. Again, this resolution is not asking for legalization and legalization is not the topic today. Um, like I said, uh, to answer, there's no line item budget for this, but rather police time is taxpayer money spent. And um, we are just asking to stop spending taxpayer money, which is police time, on criminalizing ethnogenic plant use. Although we've had more Missoulians show us that they support this resolution than anything else the council has had this entire year, I, I do want to address the one um, sole opponent to this resolution's comments uh, from Chief White. Um, Although Chief White was the only public commenter in opposition and had declared ethnogenic plants to be dangerous and has taken a stance against this himself, there was no democratic process in asking the Missoula Police Department's officers what they think. There was no survey of police officers, and some of these Missoula police officers actually do support this resolution. I've talked to police officers in Missoula that 
said that they would rather spend their time fighting crimes that have victims rather than trying to fight crimes of what people do with their own body. As Missoula policymakers, we intend for this resolution to be a partnership with the Missoula Police Department. After our meetings in April with Missoula Police Department about this resolution, uh, we added the second therefore clause to this um, in response to the police's feedback. And um, just to clarify some of the things that this resolution is not, like it's not um, giving up, you know, it's not um, with manufacturing or selling, driving under the influence, bringing these to school, et cetera. This does not cover any of those. And I'm happy to amend that uh, therefore clause to add any other clarifying language. Um, and again, this is not the Missoula Police Department's fault that we as a society have been immorally arresting people for anthogenic plant use over the last 50 years. This is the fault of policymakers like ourselves. It is the policymakers over the last 50 years that have you know, pass these immoral laws and are upholding these immoral laws with their votes. Now that I've answered some of those lingering questions from the last meeting, I want to make just a quick final pitch for why we should vote to pass this resolution today. One, more Missoulians have asked us for this resolution than anything else this year, including veterans, all those drug treatment counselors that came to the last meeting, um, and so on and so forth. Anthenogenic plants have proven to be beneficial to addressing mental disorders and mental illnesses. And also the current drug policies that we're living under do not match with our Jedi goals and are disproportionately harming people of color and people who are low income. So we must follow, you know, take a stance towards Jedi and pass this resolution. Arresting Missoulians for anthenogenic plant use, again, makes it harder for those Missoulians to then find secure housing and to find a secure job. And it overall is a, causes a ripple effect of hurting people's lives under this current policy. And lastly, the government should not dictate what people do with their own bodies, period. Okay, so that's an overview and some comments from the count or the committee's, or, sorry, resolution sponsor. Um, okay, so I'm gonna now give, oh yes, uh, Kirst, or Kristen, sorry. Do you mind it? Can I, can I throw a few comments in as well? So, um, Since I'm a yes. co-sponsor. Yep, and yeah. this in, Okay, sure. Yeah, go ahead. What? Oh, no, I just sounds great. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to add a couple of things to what Daniel said. Um, you know, this isn't the first time Missoula City has tried to pass, well, actually not even pass, but to, to work against state law for issues it's found um, important. Um, so the vaping ordinance is a really good example of, of a really good effort that the city council made that directly went against state law. Um, I'd also like to add that we are working at a st on a statewide level to have this changed um, in the MCA and have some really good traction and buy-in from state level officials at this point. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, and this is, it's, for a long time there have been um, kind of just a saying in the criminal justice space that we need to stop criminalizing uh, mental health. We need to stop criminalizing um, abuse disorders. And I think that this falls right into that because what happens when people are experiencing um, mental health issues and using these particular substances to address those mental health issues are not related to um, a substance abuse issue. This is actually genuine healthcare that is backed by a lot of scientific research. And I, I lastly would like to say that um, you know, Missoula is a really progressive community in the state of Montana. Um, as far as the national curve goes, we are really far behind the criminal justice best practices reform space. We are very progressive criminal justice wise in our state, which is a very low bar. Um, national standards are much higher and we're very well behind the curve. Um, this particular value statement that we could provide as a city council will help us get on the right side um, and the right side of that criminal justice reforms curve and to help us think outside of the box um, and allow people to um, address their mental health and their, their actual health care in a way that works for them that is backed by science. And this is a bold movement for us to take. It is, it is a bold movement because it does upset a few people, but it's the right approach when it comes to supporting people who have mental health issues, mental health issues. And it's also something that Missoula City has done in the past as far as making value statements. And I, I just am really 
passionate about this work. Daniel's done most of it. Actually, I'll just throw out props to Daniel, but I really support what's come out of it. And I would ask you folks to really think deeply about what it is that really bothers you about this, if you do have something that bothers you, and whether or not it's um, going to cause more harm to our society or less harm. Um, there's very little in this resolution, if anything at all, that's going to cause more harm to our to our um, society. And I think that the link is really weak between um, substance use uh, availability and teen usage in this space. Um, it might be different for marijuana, but it'll be a trustee liaison. I'll be interested to hear what Leah has to say in that space. Um, but yeah, I just ask you to really think um, what it is that you uh, find unnerving about this resolution and see if it's something that we can't talk about and that we can't come together and, and make a value statement as, as a city council saying, we know we can do better and we know we can cause less harm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Okay, great. Um, so we've heard a uh, kind of overview from the uh, resolution sponsors, and then we'll now um, ask for comment from our folks from the City County Health Department, as well as All Nations Health Center. So Leah, would you like to go first? And sure, I think we I all want you to send us your background photo when we're done, because that looks oh. great. <laughs> That's actually the Virgin Islands where I just was a couple of weeks ago. So um, hi everyone, I'm Leah Fitzbrody and my pronouns are she, hers. I work at the Missoula City County Health Department and I do substance use disorder prevention work there. Um, I've been in this position almost seven years. Um, and thank you so much for having me. I know Deshane was able to speak a bit on the last meeting or wasn't able to be there because I was there, um, the Virgin Islands last time. Um, and so I've just been asked today to kind of uh, talk a little bit from the substance use disorder prevention uh, kind of realm. And, and I asked Faith, who is also getting her doctorate in this in this area to um, also speak. So I'm gonna speak briefly and then ask Faith to speak. Um, so, and really the, the question was, you know, it. I, I, we were talking a little bit about um, what we've seen so far with, um, with, with marijuana because uh, what we're seeing across the country is a very similar kind of wave um, with this particular substance as there was with, with marijuana. So, um, you know, uh, first it was decriminalized, right? Um, here in Montana, then it was approved for medicinal use and then uh, now it is legalized. And so um, what, um, uh, so basically, um, since legalization in Montana, we have already seen, a uh, if for marijuana, we've already seen a 22% increase in regular marijuana use among high schoolers in Missoula County. This is according to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So um, back in the spring of 2019, 20% of high schoolers use marijuana on a regular basis. And then after legalization in, in spring of 2021, 24.5%. 2% of high schoolers use marijuana on a regular basis. And part of that is because um, what, as a state and as a, as a community, I think that we didn't do enough to really think about, okay, yes, we wanna decriminalize this and we wanna make sure that it's legalized, but also what does this mean for our youth? And um, in a state where our youth are already using more than, um, than many other states in the nation, um, we really need to think about that. We have one of the highest per capita of dispensaries in in, um, in the country, um, in our city. So we have 52 uh, for a county population of, of 100, 121,520 people. The Public Health Institute recommends one for every 19,000 people, and it would only recommend six dispensaries for a city of our size. Um, and we are way past that. Um, so just to kind of, that's just kind of showing a little bit about um, what's happening in terms, what happened in terms of marijuana, which um, just really wanting to, people to be mindful of, do we really want to follow in that vein where we didn't do a lot to think about what this could possibly mean for the youth in our community? Faith, do you want to speak a little bit? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Leah, for showing that um, pattern, I guess, in that line of thought in terms of decriminalization and then medicinal use and then recreation, because I'm going to talk a little more about that and the research that um, is out there in terms of entheogenic plants. Um, so I am the community prevention coordinator at All Nations Health Center, working with substance use and suicide prevention for youth. And 
also a doctoral student in prevention science. Um, so I just want to start with saying that it, like in the age of the, you know, the internet and social media, it's become increasingly difficult for the public to distinguish evidence-based knowledge from misinformation. So I have um, done a brief review of some of the current literature on the benefits of uh, psychedelic entheogenic plant research. And I'll share with you the scientific conclusions to date. And I've got kind of got four points to make, but the first um, is the current scientific conclusions are that there's not enough research. And I think this resolution is getting out ahead of that. Um, most of the literature on the psychedelics has been limited by small sample sizes and difficulties with blinding, other things, exclusion, exclusion of participants with um, comorbidities and histories of drug use, other things. So that we don't know that these work um, at the general population level. It's, it's been really small samples of certain people. And the Federal Food and Drug Administration and the National Institute of Health were both recently asked by Congress to summarize their current understanding of the medical potential and the risks of psychedelics. And, and what they had to say was that there is additional research needed to evaluate the risks associated with psychedelic drugs and their potential use to treat mental illnesses and particularly the effects of long-term use on the health and behavior and their potential for misuse. So that was in 2019. They're saying there's still um, not enough research out there and they are doing research and then when there is enough research, science would be able to determine like what kind of dose should be used, what level is safe and what's efficacious for different mental health conditions, um, what types of settings and what kind of supervision should these be used under medical supervision, things like that. So those are the science needs to explore those things as well. Yet um, one of the substances I saw that was named in that presentation presentation that you guys received the PowerPoint last time that, that is called Ibogaine. And that was named in that presentation as having potential for substance use treatment, addiction treatment. But that one was recently determined by the FDA not to have any therapeutic benefit or that the risks, which is death, and that outweighed any potential benefits. And, they, and that was part of this FDA and NIH document. Um, so currently these these substances are schedule one because there is a, a high potential for abuse and there's no currently accepted medical use, but they are doing research. And when they believe that this should change, they will do so. Um, my second point is that there are commercial interests at play in this. And we know we've seen with the marijuana industry that commercial interests can push that narrative of substances having more benefits than the research currently supports while simultaneously downplaying health risks. And so that what the, there is a national movement out there for the push to legalize psychedelics. And it's driven by um, things such as popular media, concerns over criminalization, funding, from wealthy enthusiasts and the prospect of making money from, from commercialization of drugs. Uh, and the end game is, is commercialization of, of all drugs. And so some folks do see the potential for a psychedelic industry similar to medical marijuana in that, that we've seen that that industry has made many health claims that are not, uns they're unsupported by scientific research, but it did open the door to legalization of marijuana recreationally. And what we've seen with the, the marijuana industry is like there's no dosing levels and they've rapidly been increasing the levels of THC potency to correspond with its addictive potential. And like Leah said, we've been seeing increases in use youth and increases in cannabis use disorder in states that have legalized. Um, and in some places where they have passed resolutions like this and decriminalized or, or made um, entheogenic plants low priority for law enforcement. They have seen illegal businesses open by people that are trying to get ahead of that, the perspective, what they expect to be commercialization. Um, as a native person, I wanted to bring up my third point is concerns uh, from indigenous communities. 
Um, in other communities that have tried to pass a resolution like this, there have been objections from the Native American community. And I saw indigenous use of plants referenced in this resolution, and I believe peyote, which is used by the Native American church should fall under this resolution. And I don't know if you folks have consulted with any of the native community here, but there are folks that are, belong to the Native American church within our community. And native people already by law have the rights to consume the uh, entheogenic plants as part of, it's as part of a religious ceremony. Uh, so with some different constructs around there and guardrails. And so some native people are seeing this decriminalization movement as really a gentrification of sacred plants and potentially has the potential to decimate some of the population of these plants if they're open to everyone's use. And so I would say that in addition, because native people already have access to their, sac their sacramental plants by law, that this is less of a social justice issue for that population than there are. And there are other substances that have a higher level of impact in terms of criminalization. And my last point is just my concerns as a prevention professional for our youth. And I'm concerned that the message that this resolution may send to youth that substance use is the answer to mental health issues. And in fact, there are the research is not yet there for this. So I mean, you know, it may, it may come there, but it's not there yet. And there are there are proven evidence-based strategies for improving mental health and things like therapy and even getting physical activity and even exposure to nature are all also good to, for mental health. Um, and in prevention science, we have what are called risk and protective factors. So things that either put youth at risk or protect them, protect them from harmful behaviors. And community norms and laws are one of those things that can, it can either be a risk or a protective factor for our youth and it does impact their behavior. So I just urge you to keep that in mind as you consider this resolution. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Leah, did you have anything uh, to round out before we move on from the presentation from health and um, all nations? No, I, I think uh, I think Faith said a, a lot of what, what uh, needed to be heard and um, yeah, thank you. All right, great. So it does appear as though we have now heard from um, everybody who, who wanted to weigh in from an, an expert standpoint. And so next in order of operations is I'm happy to open it up for questions from council members. Um, and then we will move to uh, public comment. And then we will move to uh, finally uh, just general comments from council members before we um, do a vote. So um, got a cue coming up here. So uh, I these are questions. Um, and we'll start with Mr. Clarleo. Uh, thanks. Um, I guess, you know, I mean, just to try and follow up on that last thing, I'll turn it into a question, but, um, out of the data that we do have from Missoula, one third of the people that were arrested, um, for anthogenic, solely anthogenic plant use were Native Americans. Um, and thus everybody that was arrested you know, we'll have to deal with the hardship of trying to find housing and find a good job after they have to navigate a criminal record. Um, and I also just want to point out that this is not a legalization resolution. Um, I'll say that as many times as I have to, I suppose. We're trying to decriminalize drugs or decriminalize anthropogenic plants because when we criminalize drugs, we are harming people. They are the victim from the government. Um, and I guess my question is, do you have any um, data that you could present us um, that's not an opinion piece about um, the decriminalization of these plants and how that's affected use? Yeah, I'm happy to provide that um, FDA, and, FDA and NIH document where they kind of summarize all of that research. Thanks so much for, uh, if you can either uh, send it directly or send it to myself and I can pass it along. Um, and I do think it's important that the stats that the chief gave in our last meeting uh, highlighted that yes, there had been four arrests, that the one um, native person who was arrested for ethnogenic was a minor. And so there could have been, um, you know, it's a minor. So under any circumstances, they shouldn't have had uh, access to that. Um, okay, moving up in our queue, uh, Ms. Jordan. 
Um, thank you. Yeah, so I, I guess my question for um, Leah and Faith is, you know, we talk a lot about how, um, you know, abstinence, abstinence isn't necessarily the best approach in addressing issues. And I wonder, you know, when we talk about the potential for youth using these, if we if we decriminalize them as a value statement here in Missoula, um, is that not less effective than actually addressing the root causes for why children want to use substances? Because I'm thinking that generally substance use is related to um, an underlying issue. It's not always just because the cool kids are doing it. And I'm wondering what you folks think about um, how it might actually be more important to address the root causes rather than, you know, um, saying no to a resolution that helps reset our needle in line with criminal justice reforms, best practices, um, and may end up causing more harm to the folks who still get arrested for this than it would benefit youth if we don't pass this value statement. Thank you. Either Leah or Faith, do either one of you want to answer that question? Don't jump in both at once. <laughs> Faith, do you want to do you want to answer right? Well, I had some thoughts while you were while you were saying this, and and I had some thoughts while I was doing research to present to you folks, and and, and on um yeah root causes, and and I would love to see a resolution about about that and addressing some of the root causes of substance use for for youth in our community. But the it goes it stands that the community uh, laws and norms that do those do impact youth. So I think this does send a message. They'll see a story in the newspaper that Missoula is promoting magic mushrooms. I mean, that's the way the story was in the in KPAX um, uh, about this resolution uh, in the news recently. And that's how youth are gonna see it. Oh, well, we are, these folks think it's okay, then it's probably just fine for me to, uh, experiment with that as well. I think once, you know, once the science is there that there really is uh, some mental health benefits for this, when there's, once there is enough research, then by all means, I mean, I care about youth mental health as well. If, if that is a, a treatment someday, but I don't, I just don't believe it's there yet. And I, yeah, I don't think um, we're ready for that. It's, I don't think it's, it's there yet. There's not enough science and neither does the FDA or the NIH. Yeah, and I think just one thing that I just want us to think about too. Um, and again, like the health department, we don't have a specific position about this, but I'm just talking about it as a prevention person, but thinking about knowing that the earlier that someone starts to use a substance, the more likely that they are to develop a substance use disorder later on. So, so what's in the resolution talking about how this can be something that can help treat addiction? Um, it's also a concern to think about, okay, so if we are, if, if the laws and norms are influencing whether or not um, a, a youth starts to use, and, and if we see an increase, so um, we know that 7% of youth in Missoula County are already using halluc hallucinogens in some way, and that includes mushrooms. Um, so if we see an increase in youth use, are we also contributing to the problem? So it seems like, just be, just be thinking about that. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm noticing that the time, and I do want to make sure that we give an opportunity for folks who are in the audience. So how about we just, um, I'm going to make it easier so we can do questions or comments from council members, but do want to make sure that, um, you know, we have about five people in the audience. So those folks who are in the audience who would like to make um, public comment on this agenda, please go ahead and raise your hand so I can get a sense of who all is here and would like to uh, speak so that I can manage time accordingly. With that said, we'll continue on the queue from council members with questions or comments because technically there's a motion on the floor. Um, still navigating new rules and, and two part committee meetings. So uh, next in the queue line, I have Miss West. So I'm gonna just quickly ask a question um, and I'll hold my comments for a little bit later after we've heard from the public. Um, but I, I was wondering um, 
what this deciding factor is to have the, the three listed compounds that are in the resolution. Um, there are many other um, compounds that have entheogenic uses that are plant derived. And I just, um, yeah, like what's the reasoning behind just having these three? Dr. Norris, do you want to take that one? Yeah, certainly, yeah. So these uh, the three compounds specifically on this resolution are cryptamine, phenethylamine, and indolamines. Uh, this really, I think, addresses all the plants that are on Schedule 1, plants and mushrooms that are on Schedule 1. On Schedule 2, we have things like uh, poppy and coca. Uh, those work off of a dopamine receptor system versus a serotonin receptor system. Uh, that was one of the questions I was going to ask uh, the the health um, the public health folks there sort of distinguish uh, for the rest of everyone here the difference between serotonin and dopamine how there's a significant difference in terms of craving and want behavior and I'll speak to this a little bit later in terms of my public comment uh, but as far as uh, as far as I know every schedule one substance uh, that we are speaking to uh, fit under the tryptamine phenethylamine and indolamine um, uh, categories. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question? Yep. So I'm specifically thinking of uh, like opiate or opium derivatives with, it. of course, our morphine and codeine, and those are not a schedule one, they're schedule two. Is that what you're saying? Yes, poppy, uh, it's, it's, if we're talking about natural plants and mushrooms, uh, poppy yeah. and coca are both schedule two. And okay. so those are the opioid and the, the, um, the cocaine or, or those types of things. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Okay, um, we're gonna pop over to, we have uh, one hand raised in the queue for public comment. So we'll go ahead and take that and then move back to council members. Um, let's see, so Kevin Peterson, you should be able to unmute yourself and provide comment. We'd love for you to keep it as close to three minutes as possible. Uh, no problem, thank you everybody. Uh, I just had a question uh, for Faith Price. Um, thank you for the information and the presentation. I was trying to find the study, the review that you mentioned from the NIH. So my question is, um, in addition to kind of looking at what the NIH reviewed, you, I think you said 2018, since then, you know, the clinical trials for psilocybin in particular have advanced quite a bit, I think, to phase two, moving towards phase three recently. And there's, you know, substantially, I think there's probably newer evidence, um, newer data, and I was wondering if you broadened your review to take into account, you know, more recent research. And if you could kind of speak to this a little bit more broadly, like I understand that the FDA and the NIH are going to be conservative and they're going to like really address the fact that the research has been constrained by the government for decades. But I think it just defies common sense to kind of limit your opinion based on that very narrow, safe government review. So could you speak to kind of your awareness of the broader field of, re of research, uh, the most, you know, kind of recent developments, and as well, just kind of acknowledge that, you know, in the 50s and 60s, thousands, thousands of studies were conducted, thousands of subjects. Um, and before things were kind of derailed culturally, and we had a pretty negative backlash driven by the government, driven by the war on drugs, there was quite substantial evidence that these substances were not only safe, but quite efficacious for mental health. So thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. So technically we're, we only take public comment, um, but a council member can ask uh, the question on your behalf um, is kind of how our rules uh, work. So um, I don't see anybody else in the queue for comments uh, from the public. I do see Mr. Norris, um, they're queued up. Oh, okay. So Mitch, Okay, we'll do Dr. Norris as a member of the public to give his comments. Then we'll go over to um, the one in the queue. If anybody else who's in the queue wants to, please go ahead and raise your hand now and don't wait till the other people are and done speaking so I can basically want to make sure I manage time because we got 23 minutes left. So Mr. Norris, if you'd like to provide public comment. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Missoula City Council and staff. Thank you very much for the robust, robust conversation that we've been having at this in the last meeting. My name is Dr. Larry Norris. I'm the co-founder of the Decriminalized Nature National Movement. Uh, here's a brief summary of some of the important points we discussed at our previous meeting. Uh, while sample sizes are small, there is a lot of research that's showing uh, positive results for antigens related to end-of-life anxiety, PTSD, substance use issues, reduction in recidivism and intimate partner violence, and depression. 
In addition, a Johns Hopkins study showed it was one of the top five most meaningful experiences for healthy normals and beneficial for both personal and spiritual growth. Psilocybin, which is found in entheogenic mushrooms, has been fast-tracked by the FDA to research its effects on treatment-resistant depression. But we know these studies may take years, have a high cost, and may be monopolized by the pharmaceutical industry. On the other hand, we have access to natural plants and fungi that grow from the ground that people have been using effectively for decades, centuries, and sometimes millennia. Entheogens are not like other substances that cause craving and withdrawals leading to physical addiction. Substances like opioids and methamphetamines work on dopamine reward systems, which can lead to dependence. Entheogens mainly work with serotonin receptors, which does not create the same craving as dopamine does. Entheogens are also self-limiting, meaning multiple uses over a short time often do not have any effect. On the other hand, entheogens can be successful in treating both opioid and methamphetamine addiction. Studies on Ibogaine, for example, suggest 40 to 50% success rate where current substance use treatments have about a 10 to 15% success rate. Uh, yes, as Faith mentioned, there may be some risk to Ibogaine, uh, but they have now located this to a QT elongation of the heart, which is rare and testable. And risk is relative. I had a friend of mine who was uh, said, I, I'm, I'm not going to live past this month. So please let me try something to break my, my heroin addiction. And now 23 years later, he's totally clean. If these materials were decriminalized, some suggest the success for treat treating substance use issues would increase because resources and community would be able to provide proper follow-up care for an individual going through this process. I also understand there may be some fear around potential increased youth, uh, use in youth, uh, but this concern does not seem to pan out uh, on recent research on the topic related to cannabis nationwide. Here are some examples. The head of the Federal Drug Agency, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, Director Nora Valco, stated in August 2021 interview that despite her fears that use of marijuana among adolescents would go up when states move to legalize cannabis, that overall it hasn't. Another analysis published by the Journal of American Medical Association analyzed federal youth risk behavior survey data from 1993 to 2019 in 10 medical or adult use states. They stated cannabis policy change uh, instead has had an overall impact on adolescent cannabis consumption that is statistically indistinguishable from zero. The U.S. Department of Education's National Center for Education Statistics also analyzed youth surveys of high school students from 2009 to 2019, included that there has been no measurable difference in the percentage of those in grades 9 through 12 who reported consuming cannabis at least once in the past 30 days. Uh, a federally funded uh, monitoring for future report released late last year found that cannabis consumption among adolescents did not significantly change in any of the three grades for lifetime use, past 12-month use, past 30-day use, and daily use from 2019 to 2020. In fact, they found that despite substance use issues going up in the general population due to COVID, youth cannabis uh, uh, use decreased from 2020 to 2021. Eighth graders showed a 4% decrease, 10th graders showed 11% decrease, and 12th graders showed a 5% decrease. A study on youth cannabis consumption in Colorado shows the same. Dell Quigley, Quigley, a law enforcement officer since 1979 and deputy director uh, or coordinator for the National Marijuana Initiative, a project for the high intensity drug trafficking area program stated, and looking at the state of Colorado for 12 to 17 year old current use, we had a spike in 14, but overall the use rates in Colorado have been declining and that matches what we're seeing in other states and also the trend we're seeing nationally. He added, for some reason, the use rate among this age bracket is going down. We're not 100% sure why it's going down. It's a good thing it's going down, but we don't understand why. This could be a potential benefit of decriminalization when more above ground education and support is available for the youth population and they can speak to elders in the community. A reminder that this is not a legalization model of cannabis where dispensers would be selling everywhere, but a model to ensure those engaging in practices that are, are not criminalized for the healing or spiritual practice. Uh, one question that came up uh, in the previous meeting was related to a selective enforcement of federal laws. The cannabis is still federally legal and there's not been enforced at the local level. As I mentioned previously, the 10th Amendment states the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the uh, states respectively or to the people. I think given the incredible support you have all received from the Missoula community, the people have stood up and clearly stated they wanted this change. One could also argue that healing with entheogenic plants and fungi is an unalienable human right and also protected by the First Amendment, which safeguards freedom of religion and thought. We ask you to take back your local power of government and cease arresting people that are looking for alternative modes of healing that emerge from nature. At the end of the day, we all want to do what's best for our community and their well-being. If these plants and fungi can help those who are looking for healing or personal and spiritual growth, why would we punish someone looking for relief? Thank you for your time, and I'm available for any additional questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Norris. Next, we have in the queue for public comment is Mitch Hall. You should be able to unmute yourself and provide comment. Hello, uh, yes, my name is Mitch Hall. And I am a retired engineer. I recently retired a year and a half ago, and I've always shown interest in 
mental health issues. My parents recently passed away from cancer and dementia in 2019. I have a brother who has schizophrenia. I've long had interest in pursuing um, these sorts of things, but have been held back by my own fear from repression from society. And of course, fear of the, the justice system, criminal justice system. I don't have much to say about Oh, you know, issues in the youth community and potential for addiction. I don't see I, my experience recently has been with psilocybin. I've had an opportunity to experience that. But um, now that the veil of fear of repercussions from work or the community or the criminal justice system has been lifted from me, but still. Uh, I, I have, it's uh, kind of under the veil of secrecy and kind of an underground issue for me. Um, what changed my pursuit with this was reading Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. What says it all is his subtitle, What the New Science of Psychedelics Teaches Us About Consciousness, Dying, Addiction, Depression, and Transcendence. Uh, for me, that says it all. Um, this is my own personal testimony, so um, I'm leaving it at that. Um, personally, I would like to see much more happen with this on the national level. Uh, locally, I see we have much more support in Missoula. I was able to pursue my, my pathway because of Missoula and its um, openness. Uh, I do know that there's a lot of science going on. Roland Griffiths in particular has had, uh, what I understand, FDA approved scientific research and studies, double blind studies, very well supported, very well documented, all the way back from 2016. I mean, the science may not be to the level of NIH or FDA approval, but it's very well on the way in my understanding, my limited understanding of that. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, it's a testimony, it's my public comment, and. Um, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thanks so much uh, for that. And now we'll move back to council members as there's no one else. So next up is Mike Nugent. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Carlino, you, you've referenced in both th this hearing and the last one, uh, talking about the statistics of, and, of demographic use. And, and um, I believe uh, Chief White quoted us last time a number of maybe 20 um, citations issued in this area, but 17 were linked with other violations and three or maybe it was four were solely um, violations of what's covered under this ordinance, uh, which doesn't really seem like a statistically significant number to draw conclusions from. So I'm wondering if you have any national statistics on specifically um, this uh, what we're trying to cover here, these violations, as it relates to um, demographics of who's traditionally cited? Because you've mentioned that more than once, so I would like you to, do, you to expand on it. Yeah, um, yeah, unfortunately, Chief White would only give us two years of data out of the 50 or so that it's been criminal, that this has been criminalized. Um, and I can't say that we have racial demographic data for anthenogenic plant use arrests across the country. Um, I can say that in Missoula County for marijuana use by the study from the ACLU, uh, black people were 11 times more likely to be arrested than white people for marijuana use in Missoula County, um, even though they use it at similar rates. Um, and that's, um, I think that applies similar to other drug, drug use and uh, racial disparities. Um, but I guess the other, I guess the other thing that I would mention too, is that um, you know, after the war on drugs started, the U.S. soon became the number one country in the world for incarcerating people per capita, and it's continued to increase from the war on drugs. But to have specific data on um, who is getting arrested for anthenogenic plants, there's really not enough data. And I wish Chief White would have, you know, given me the 20 or 50 year data that I asked for, but I'm confined to the public, um, public data. Follow up, Madam Chair? Yep. Um, I don't know if anybody else who's, who's spoken on this, like Dr. Norris, might have that data on the national level. Um, and the reason I ask is because that seems to be one of the arguments to do something. And, and uh, you know, the, the uh, folks from the um, health department talked about how there hasn't been enough studies yet. So I'm just wondering if that's the case across the board or not. 
Yeah, and most of uh, man, man, can answer. Yeah, uh, and most of the places that uh, we have um, looked into or decriminalized, there has been a low amount of arrests in terms of this. We don't have the demographic data in terms of how that shook out, uh, but we just know how. I mean, we can look at the history of uh, police enforcement uh, across the board, and it seems to be uh, disproportionately, um, you know, affecting uh, marginalized communities and, and such. Uh, when when somebody oftentimes. Um, you know, there's, there can be an excuse used. Well, we think this person has something on them, so then we're gonna search them and then go after them and that type of thing. Um, so by, you know, getting rid of these sort of policies that, um, you know, are, are punitive for working with plants and mushrooms that grow to the ground, uh, I think what we're trying to do here is really make sure that everyone's on the same page. Uh, everyone is being treated equally by the eyes of the law and we're making sure that it goes through a legislative process instead of a decision-making process on the police, uh, police um, you know, or, law enforcement at, at the, on the spot. But we don't have any of that data specifically in terms of demographics across the US. Right, thank you. I have one more question, Madam Chair, if that's okay. Yep. Um, uh, for either Ms. Jordan or Mr. Carlino, um, I feel like you've stated kind of different goals for what we're doing here today. Um, Ms. Jordan's talked about making a statement, which I understand and I definitely, I, I want to see less people incarcerated for nonviolent crimes. And I, I definitely understand the direction we're going. Um, but then we've got all kinds of public comment that's been presented as decriminalized nature or things of that. So I'm curious if, if maybe one of you could expand on what exactly this ordinance is going to change um, for Missoula. Yeah, I could take that. Um, so three things. Um, one, we're gonna, it's asking the, us to stop using taxpayer money to arrest people for entheogenic plant use and possession. And police time is taxpayer money. So that's the big thing. Um, the second one is that we're asking our uh, city lobbyists to support this at the state level when it comes up. And the third one is we're just trying to furnish a copy to this to the county attorney who usually ends up having to um, make the criminal decisions on this. So those are kind of the three different things. Okay, Mr. Nugent Yellen. Okay, cool. Moving on, we have Ms. Fisica. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, is there a motion on the floor or do you need one? Nope, there's a motion. Okay, great. Um, so there are a couple of comments that um, were stated today that uh, I wanted to comment on. Um, there was one about uh, how this resolution was um, was presented in the news. And um, while uh, I love all of our news uh, stations, um, so, some of them, I mean, all of them sometimes make mistakes. Um, when I did my, uh, my firearm safety resolution, someone in the news stated that it was requirement for schools and it was not recommended. So a lot of the news can make um, uh, choice, use choice words that are entirely true. So we can't use that as a reason to not support this uh, resolution. Um, regarding the youth, um, first of all, uh, this is just decriminalizing um, this. It's not making it legal. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, that are legal for adults, alcohol, uh, tobacco, they're legal for people over 21, and yet um, the youth still use them illegally. So I think that's up to the parents to um, have conversations with their children about that. Um, the government's already made, made those stuff illegal, so I'm still being used illegally. So I think that um, we can uh, draw some similarities with that. Um, I guess, uh, so I am in support of this. Um, I'm one of the most influential thinkers in the history of classical liberalism, fame, uh, John Stuart Mill. He famously wrote, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. From what I've heard throughout these uh, days of discussions is that criminalizing the use of these uh, plants is harming more than it is not harming. So I have to be in support of this and I, I will gladly um, vote yes for this. Thank you, Mrs. Hika. Ms. Jordan. Thank you. I just wanted to point out to council members, in case you're not on your email, I just did a quick search for FDA and NIH approval um, and or support for entheogenic drugs and found some right off the bat. And I've sent them to you um, that I'm hoping you'll have a look at because there is there is broadband support for research and use of these drugs um, in the mental health space. And I'd also like, if it's okay to comment a little bit on Mike, Mike's question. Um, Mike, I am bringing a bit of my criminal justice hat in on this. Um, and so Daniel and I have kind of some different takes on it, um, although ultimately the same outcome. And, and for me, it is about really thinking differently in the criminal justice space. 
uh, the criminal justice system has so many collateral consequences that it's really hard for people, and I probably preach into the choir with you specifically, but um, that are really hard for people to climb out of. And if we can reduce the, if we can reduce that burden of being criminal justice involved on victimless, but nonviolent crimes for a plant that is showing exceptional promise in treating mental health, then I'd like to be a part of that movement. And so my 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 hat is definitely from the criminal justice reform space. Um, although I definitely support alternative um, treatments to address mental health issues. Thank you. Great, thanks, Mr. Uh, Jordan. And we have Ms. West. Hey, um, I have a few comments about this, and I guess um, I would like to start off with um, just saying that as a self-government governing power or a city, we have. Um, all the powers uh, except those that are explicitly denied to us. And I don't think that this is an area where there's ambiguity in that language. Um, and while the resolution has removed the language that we're prioritizing what the police is doing, um, the effect is the same. And it also actually doesn't change any policy or get rid of any policy. And so, um, I don't have any idea how this would functionally work. Like, would we just not respond to 911 calls if there was a suspected entheogenic plant use, or would we not pay staff after the fact um, when they've already been, you know, dispatched and then have to go home or like, you know, go return um, back to you know, whatever they were doing prior to that. Um, and I also think that this provides some sort of false safety to residents in our community. There is no guarantee that it is Missoula PD that shows up to a call. 911 is dispatched through a central location and we have interlocal agreements with all of the law enforcement agencies in our area that whoever is the closest response. Um, and so that could be a sheriff. It could be maybe even a highway patrolman, depending on what the situation is and where it is. And they would not be held by this resolution. And I really wouldn't want to give people the impression that just because they are inside of the Missoula city limits, there's a different set of rules um, because it would really depend on who responds. Um, and then I also uh, just wanted to say that um, the biggest um, bump in this sort of drug enforcement actually came, uh, well, Nixon definitely laid the foundation, but actually it was the 1994 crime bill, which was passed during the Clinton administration, um, which instituted three strike laws and mandatory minimums, um, as well as a series of Supreme Court cases during the 90s. Um, that really eroded personal liberties and then um, also allowed the seizing of all sorts of property related to drug offenses, um, even if people had been convicted and charged. I think we, uh, we gloss over the history a little bit and who all has been involved in it, and it's more than just Nixon. Um, and since that time, um, we have been working on reforming the system. Um, and I actually, in theory, don't disagree that these substances have um, huge potential, um, but the reality is, is that there is no infrastructure for medical or therapeutic use. And um, even if this resolution passes, I don't think there will be any access for people to any sort of legitimate therapy you know, therapy that involve any of these substances because any healthcare professional who, uh, or mental health professional who would do this, um, you know, on a <laughs> like openly transparent basis would be at risk as lo losing all of their licenses and probably also, you know, their, their insurance and um, not be allowed to practice. And then in general, um, the word entheogenic comes from the Greek, uh, which is manifesting the God or the divine within. And I think that the list included in this resolution is actually entirely arbitrary. Um, it excludes a lot of derivatives um, from other plant species um, that also have a history 
of medical, therapeutic, and spirit spiritual use. Um, specifically, uh, things like the Datura species, which have atrophine and scopolamine, or of course, um, the opium um, poppy, which has morphine and codeine. And both of those have a long history of also being used therapeutically. And the last thing I wanna say about this is that I don't think that anyone who is actually using these substances today in the context of um, an, entheo, you know, a, a, an entheogenic use, so whether that's spiritual um, or maybe um, to derive you know, mental health benefits is uh, really at risk of being arrested. Um, or prosecuted for that. And I say that um, because the data doesn't support it in Missoula. So um, I actually really recommend that everybody read the 2021 needs assessment of the Missoula County substance use care system. Um, it actually has a really great analysis of what resources we have in our community and what our gaps are for people struggling with substance use disorders. But it also has a really detailed look on you know, what um, offenses we have seen in the last four years. So from, or 2016 and 2019, and this is publicly available data. Um, there's a uh, criminal activity data that's collected by the Montana Incident Based Reporting System. Anybody can find this um, in that four year or three year period from 2016 to 2019 in Missoula, there were 2020 offenses. Um, the bottom three of the top, I think it was 10 offenses, are related to DUI, drug equipment, and then their uh, drug narcotic, drug slash narcotics is the last category. Um, of that total of offenses, 4.36% um, were related to drug and narcotic um, offenses. And then there's a further table um, that you can find in that same study that's on page 31 um, that actually breaks down those drug and narcotic offenses um, into what substance was related to that call. And um, hallucinogens are a blip. Um, so small that it's hard to tell what number it is. Maybe I would guess 2.5% of 425, um, which I think ends up being about 2.5 offenses um, per year. So less than 10 calls in a four year period. Um, and I think that, you know, if, if I, I just, I don't see um, A, how this resolution is, in our sphere of control. Um, and then further for purely uh, private use of these substances, um, you're very unlikely to um, have an interaction with law enforcement in Missoula, um, unless you are also um, doing something else that's going to call, you know, draw attention. Okay, thanks, um, Miss West, for your comments. We'll continue on. So we are at time. Um, we have two more people from council in the queue uh, with comments. Um, we'll give you guys uh, question your time to make your comments, and then we'll move on to a vote. But we're going to run a little long. Um, just be mindful of that as we bump into our next meeting. Go ahead, hey. Mr. Carlino. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to address those last points. Um, yeah, it is clear that the biggest threat to um, to these people and in, in har harming them is policymakers making this thing criminalized still. Um, and to address um, the false sense of security, that's why, uh, yeah, we can only affect what we can, like the police department, and to the false sense of security, that's why this resolution includes our state lobbyist, our city lobbyist, supporting this at the state level later on whenever it comes up. So it's just kind of a step in that direction. And to speak to the lack of arrests, um, that's that just shows that this is going to be a really easy resolution for the police department to implement and any arrests of anthenogenic plants are immoral and it's the fault of policymakers for for having them arrested in the first place it's not the fault of the police at all um, 
And uh, and I guess lastly, um, yeah, the way that this is enforced is through police time. I've already said that, but police time is taxpayer money, and we're trying to save that. Thanks. Mr. Two quick comments. One, um, Heidi, I just wanted to let you know that we already do have two different systems between city and county, um, specifically between how things are handled through court. If you get a DUI or a charge in the county, you're going to go through justice court. They have a very different set of protocol um, and your experience. Actually, I should say before we elected our most recent judges, when we had our previous set of judges in municipal court, if you got a DUI in city court, you got a completely different experience than you would if you got a DUI and went through justice court. So we already have systems that don't really work the same. Um, and I also just wanna read real quick in case you haven't had a chance to look at the articles I sent you all via email. This is the last line of the conclusion section from the National Institute of Health. And it says, there's no way to avoid the incorporation of psychedelics into Western societies, both in the medical and in the social levels. So only progressive and regulating oriented approaches rather than repressive and persecution oriented will be a benefit for society. We don't have a lot of legs to stand on here. This is, a, this is us this is us sticking our neck out saying this is important and hopefully we're at the front line of this criminal justice reform rather than 10 years from now getting on board. Thank you. Okay, mindful that we're running long, we'll continue in the queue because we have some new hands of people who haven't spoken yet. So Ms. Becerra. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I guess, um, both Kristen and, and Daniel asked what are the concerns that council members have with this resolution and and I have quite a few but primarily for me is youth prevention we don't know what the consequences unintended consequences of passing this resolution will be um, I think that both Leah and Faith um, really articulated where my concerns um, are um, one of the things that, uh, Daniel, you mentioned uh, as, a, as a main reason for bringing this forward is uh, saving uh, taxpayers' funds and money. And, and I have to say that the resolution calls for city departments and organizations and commissions to not spend any money on, um, on the current, you know, on... on, on policies that would uh, continue to have uh, these plants as um, uh, illegal um, and, you know, can you continue with the status quo? But my concern is that if the unintended consequences of this, if this passes, would require all those departments to um, come up with solutions and mitigation practices for um, that, that would be a fallout of this resolution. The other part of the resolution that is concerning to me is that we want to spend taxpayers' dollars on the lobbyists to, to further the um, decriminalization of, of these plants. So that is uh, taxpayers' dollars that, um, in my opinion, uh, should not be used on something that's, that hasn't been um, supported by the entire community or that it's not one of our main um, strategic goals for the state to, to fix for us or to help us. Um, just very quickly, legalization is, of course, different uh, than um, decriminalization, and I, I fully understand that, but I think that the unintended consequences could be very similar. Um, I really do appreciate um, Faith's um, points about a potential uh, commercialization of this issue and, and the unintended consequences of that. Um, I see you shaking your head, but I do think that this is could easily become something that if there are no consequences, we could see an increase in use and potential commercialization. Um, so these are my... Um, my thoughts right now, uh, you have also brought up um, being immoral if we continue to support these policies that are in place. And um, I have to say that I don't appreciate that. I will not be supporting it. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Becerra. Ms. Sapp. Thank you. Um, I, I will be brief um, because I'm kind of gonna echo some things that people have already said. First of all, I do want to call out and appreciate all of the public outreach that we've had with this issue, um, the calls, the emails, the voicemails. I mean, 
Um, I have really appreciated hearing from people. And I also wanna say that I actually am in support of um, ethnogenic plants um, in the treatment of anxiety, depression, PTSD. I think that, um, you know, my husband is a clinical therapist and there's a lot of, even if it's anecdotal, there's a lot of research out there that in a clinical use, um, these things can be effective. And so it's the clinical use piece though that has me hung up um, because that's not what we're talking about here. Um, and I guess to me, it just, I'm just really still not sure what this accomplishes. And so I know you gave the three points, Daniel, I, I get that, but like, I'm just, I don't know that it's our place and maybe this is just a newbie question, but is it our place to tell the city lobbyists to do anything that, that's not an employee of this council? It's not a, we are not responsible for that person's job description. So I, I'm just not sure that there's an authority piece there. And I agree with Mirta that um, in terms of, I, I mean, I would way rather, rather see this sort of something like this on the ballot or something along the way, because I'm just not sure this is just within the purview of this, of this body. Um, and, you know, and just to be clear, I do understand the difference between legalization and decriminalization. You've brought that up several times, and I just want to make sure that, that it's clear that I do understand the difference. Um, and I also really did appreciate um, all of the comments from Faith and Lee and DeShane um, on the last uh, committee meeting call. And so um, I guess those are, those are my comments. I'm just, not, I'm just not totally sure what we're trying to accomplish with this. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Savage. Mr. Nugent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I appreciate all the, the effort that's gone into this. And I, it's kind of a weird place because I definitely feel strongly that we, we shouldn't be, um, you know, putting serious criminal things on people's criminal records that, that can impact them in a way where they're nonviolent and, and maybe they aren't dangerous to a certain level. Um, my biggest concern with this, and it's kind of why I asked the question of what will this do, um, I, I more fall in line with Ms. Jordan's um, suggestion that we really are sending a message that I do with um, the idea that this is going to substantively do anything. Because at the end of the day, even if we pass this and it goes into effect, a city of Missoula police officer can still write a citation for this state law. Um, and I think that that kind of illustrates that when we talk about policymakers have made this an issue, they have, but not the city council of Missoula. Like, you know, we, we follow the laws of, um, you know, the state of Montana. And, you know, I think we put our officers in kind of an interesting position when we guide them out of it, though I know that we have in the past done that. Um, I, would, I would much rather keep talking about this. And I think that the, the thought of, of having Missoula kind of encourage this issue to be worked on at the state level is a lot more intriguing to me than passing something that I think doesn't do much. I think that, you know, if, if we're going to, you know, talk about the benefits to society, whether we agree with it or not, we need the, the sidebars of the FDA or some entity saying, this is how it works, because otherwise we have an unregulated world where, where there may be good and there may be bad, and there may be people taking advantage of things like that. And I just don't know that I'm at a point today where I think we're, we're making a difference in that broader conversation. Um, so I definitely appreciate all the thought and all the effort. And like I said, I, I would be open to a, a further conversation or a different conversation on how the city can work with the state to better handle this and other um, criminal offenses that are, that are causing issues in our jail overpopulation, jail crowding, people's permit records that aren't necessary to be there um, in a way that actually will have true um, impact and make a difference. And so I guess that's kind of where I'm at right now, but I really do appreciate all the thought and effort that's gone into this. Okay, great. We are basically now officially cutting into public uh, works time. Um, Mr. Hess, I will give you the final word before we move to the vote. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate what, what Mr. Nugent just said. I, I, um, I have read this resolution in depth. I've, I've enjoyed the um, primarily being an observer of the, of the conversation. Um, and um, I am um, really compelled by, by um, a lot of the whereas clauses. I um, 
I'm also really compelled by what um, what um, Faith Price has has um, communicated to us today about the state of, of research um, and um, and of the, the consultation um, with um, with our local native peoples. I think that's I think that's something that's really important. And I think if that if that hasn't been done, it, it should be done. Um, I'm also really compelled by the firsthand experiences given by our public commenters and um, and um, the information provided by Dr. Norris. Um, and I'm lastly, I'm, I'm conflicted about um, about. I mean, hands down, our drug policy in this country is broken, and and I'll and I'll I'll and our criminal justice system is is um, has some severe systematic problems that um, systemic problems that that need to be addressed. Um, I'm um, I'm not sure about the tool. I guess I'm I'm not sure about the first um, the first um, operative clause, the first there are therefore clause. Um, it it does put our um, city employees who are who take an oath um, to uphold state law um, in a in a difficult position. Um, so I guess I'm with Mike on where I um, with Mr. Nugent where I, I feel like um, I'm not um, I'm not fully there yet. Um, but um, it sounds like we're voting. So I'll, um, with that, I guess, um, well, I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, um, Mr. Carlino. Thanks, really quick. Um, I motion to uh, keep this item in committee until January, 2024. Sorry, you can't do that. Um, there's currently a motion on the floor and we are, Per our rules, we have to dispense with the motion. It can be withdrawn. Is here, oh. Um, so, uh, very first thing, as soon as uh, the presentation was done, Miss Jordan made the motion to move forward um, the resolution. So, withdraw. Okay, no problem. Okay, so now that motion is off the floor. So we have no motion on the floor, Mr. Carlino. I motion to table this item until January twenty twenty four. Okay. Point of order. Um, uh, yep. Just so motions to table are non-debatable, um, and um, so that's why I called the point of order. Um, and, and they're limited to um, to six months. Six months. Um, and so, um, yeah. Okay. So here's. Yes. So motion to table, non-debatable, and so we will move forward with the vote to motion to table, um, and. Basically, it needs to, if we vote to table it, you have six months to basically get a majority of council members to vote to untable it, except for Miss Jones just raised her hand, and now I think she's going to correct me. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, be sure to call for public comment on the motion to table. Got it. Okay. Cool. So motion to table is in order. Can't be debated amongst the council members. It has a six month timeline. So basically if nothing happens in six months, the resolution is no longer a current resolution, which gives you the opportunity to rewrite, do more work, or you can bring it back off the table onto the floor with a vote of majority council. So this is our first table of the year. So that's why I want to give that a little bit of uh, context. So motion on the floor is to table. We will now take public comment on the motion on the floor to table. There is now no more public comment on the motion on the floor. Okay, so great. So the vote right now is uh, to Mr. Carlino's motion and he's the um, presenter of the resolution. So- um, is there's to... point of order. There's one person that has oh, their hands up in the public. Back. Okay, they took it down, they put it back up. So sorry, that's how I missed it. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, Michelle Risho, um, going to move um, to- comment on the uh, both, ugh, sorry, can't talk, motion to table. Thank you. And thank you for your really insightful comments and questions. I've learned a lot today. And I also um, am in favor of tabling this in, for six months. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. Diana, um, could you please do a roll call vote? Starting the vote, Stacy Anderson. Yes. Merita Becerra? Yes. Daniel Carlino? Yes. John Contos? No. Jordan Hess? Yes. Gwen Jones? Yes. Kristen Jordan? Yes. Mike Nugent? Yes. 
Jennifer Savage. Yes. Sandra Vasica. Yes. And Heidi West. Yes. We have 10 yeses, one no, one absent. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone for great discussion, uh, a little bit of parliamentary procedure and for the time for our uh, for folks who presented both public comment, uh, expert commentary. Um, thank you all. And it looks like we will continue to discuss this and learn more. Have Thanks, a great day. Um, hey, quickly before we adjourn, uh, where's Mirta? Mirta, how would you like to handle the start of public works, which is technically scheduled for three minutes ago? Do you wanna give everyone a break? or how no, are you doing? No, our, our staff is um, gonna try to set up as quickly as possible. Okay, folks. So if you could just go over to Public Works and we'll get going with that. I appreciate your time and patience. Have a great day. We're adjourned.